Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Vince, and I've been doing admissions since 1989 and college counseling since 1998 in California. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm blessed to work alongside both of my daughters. It's School Match for You, a college counseling firm I founded in 2010. This week in the news, Vince and I will discuss an LA Times article entitled The Most Lucrative Majors. Some community college grads can out-earn elite university peers. Julie and I will answer a question from a listener comes from a college counselor, and she wants to know, can a student submit a poem about themselves instead of an essay about themselves for the personal statement? Wait till you hear what Julie and I have to say about that. How's that for a tease? Lisa will continue her outstanding interview with Evan Mandry in the final part in her interview about Evan's book, Poison Ivy. And we'll have a brand new college spotlight as Linda recently visited the University of San Francisco. And Linda and Lisa will talk about the University of San Francisco, the other USF. And that'll be a two-parter, so part one of two. Hey, Vince, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Doing great. Looking forward to September, and, and we're about a month away. Yeah, I know. It's game on time here. Common apps open and everything. It's down to business. <laughs> down to business. Well, thanks again for sending uh, such great articles. Another great article that we're going to discuss in a few minutes was uh, uh, one that Vince Vince found. And I love it how our, whole, how our whole team is always learning and always staying sharp and always reading everything to keep abreast of everything. I mean, because if you don't, you're, you know, you're either – growing or you're dying or you're atrophying you know there's no such thing as like staying where you are either going backwards or moving forward and you can't doesn't matter if you've been doing this for 40 45 plus years like there's so much current stuff to stay abreast with and you got to stay on it or you'll be like a dinosaur Mm -hmm. but before we be dive in and discuss the discuss the article i've got a tip and you know, this tip is is really for parents. And so all of the college-specific questions are out now. Uh, in some cases, they've been out, uh, you know, for a while, depending on the school. I've seen them as early as late June go up on blogs, you know, but now we're into August. So they're all out. They're, they're, they're on the websites, they're the Common App. And one thing that parents can do is parents are always looking for what can I do in this process and you know, I love it when I say I've got a parent project they smile because sometimes they're looking for stuff to do and a lot of it is all the student the student the student you know one thing that 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 parents can do is they can put together a really nice spreadsheet for their students and then you know the first column you have the name of the school the next column any college specific question that that college is asking yeah and then the third column, you can have the word count. And the fourth column can be the due date. And then a fifth column, I like to have just check mark yes or no, meaning you've completed it. And that's might seem like a little thing, but it, it's actually really helpful to have this master top end view where the student can look and see all the work that they have to do in one place. Yeah. Let's them see the big picture. First of all, sometimes you can see, is there potential to repurpose an essay for another school? Yeah. Sometimes you can't, but sometimes you can, especially if they don't have anything in that question at all about their school. So if they ask, for example, what's an extracurricular activity that was particularly meaningful for you? 
you get that question twice, that has no component of customization to the college. And you can use that. Now, you might have to take one. One might be 250 words and one might be 150. And so there might have to be two versions of it. But you at least have, you know, some of the same concepts and use some of the same research that you want to share. But but the tip is, as a parent, it's a good thing you can do is is put to that, that spreadsheet together for your student so they can see all the work that they have to do in one felt swoop and do that big top bird's eye overview. And then they can, you can, I like people to start attacking the college specific questions in the order of the, of the due dates and when they want to submit stuff. And you got to be aware of priority deadlines and things like that. So if you're applying, you know, early action, you first look at all your early action schools. If you're identifying your early action schools, or if there's a rolling admission school, we know and if these terms are new, friends, um, rolling admissions, it's a way schools decide. It's an applic- It's a way some schools allow students to apply, where as applications roll on and decisions roll on out. And so they come in and they get read, and you can have a decision in some cases in August, in, depending on the school, if you get it in early. Whereas with other forms of, of file reading, a lot of times they may stack up in a pile and get read, get read um, you know, together you know, by school groups as opposed to read and decisioned and moved on out. So for your rolling admission schools, early action schools, prioritize them over your, you know, schools that might have, have later, later application de- uh, deadlines. Uh, but that's just a parent project. They can put that together and for their student. It's one less thing for, for students to have to do. So that's my tip. Any thoughts on that, Vince? I love it. I love it. You know, and I have, um, you know, families pull that together. And often it's, <laughs> they count those essays up and I'm, they're like, I'm not applying to, you know, 20 schools because I have to write 60 essays. And it's a, that can be a game changer alone. It helps you with the list. Like, am I really committed to this? Why, why am I doing that? So that's a really good point. Yeah. Giving, getting that information down really helps that list get, come down to the, you know, be, brass tactics, you know, the places you really want to go. So that's a great exercise. Good tip. Yeah. And our admissions vernacular is the word today is called foundational school. Mm -hmm. Now, Vince knows this. There's a zillion terms for out there. We all have our ones that we like for how difficult a school is going to be to get into. And there's some people that use foundational school for what others might refer to as like a target school or a, a possible school, or some people call them mid-range schools or coin toss schools. I mean, these are the 50-50s that could kind of go either way. And where you as an applicant look very much like a lot of applicants in, the, in that applicant pool. Don't look necessarily stronger than a lot or weaker than a lot. You know, your academic record, which is the first part of the evaluation, looks very similar to a lot of schools that are admitted. And so some people refer to those as, as foundational schools. It's, I know people have to be going crazy because I am pulling your hair out, all the different terms out here. We all have our own little favorites. In fact, one of the things that was really hard for me, Vince, uh, you know, we started using College Kickstart with all of our students that we work with. Yeah. And I have my own terms that I like to use. And I'm somebody that believes the language is very powerful. So I'm very deliberate in use of language. You know, you'll hear me intentionally say college specific essays and custom questions. I don't like the term supplementals, even that even in the common app, they use that term because I think that implies less than and then and then then, therefore people rush through them and think that they're not important. So I'm very intentional in my language. I haven't really liked the term reach school because I find that or or definitely not safety, you know, just because who wants to go to us, who wants to go to their safety. And I find that reach just makes people aspire to it more and automatically assume it's always the better option. Yes. Yes. But I've been forced into some of that language because college kickstart uses unlikely reach target and likely as their four. And and I'm like, this is gonna be too confusing for me to impose my favorite terms on, on, on people I work with. And then they hear, here's a system using another. So I understand like there's overload of all these terms and it's probably enough to make people pull their, hair out, but we all have our, our preferences. There's literally about six to eight terms that people use for 
for like the almost impossibles, the highly rejectives, the, you know, <laughs> the, the, the wild cards, the, you know, some people call, some people call them uh, far reaches. There is also reach for alls and several other terms. You know, there's a zillion terms for every, for every category, you know, every category out there. So I know that can be a little frustrating and when no one's expected to know them all. What's important is that you have a balanced list. Yeah. Not, not about the terminology, but that is a term that's oftentimes used for those schools that could kind of, could kind of go either way. And, and for our, our big number, this is from another article that Vince sent me called Why Does College Tuition Have So Many Extra Fees? Mm-hmm. And this article actually took a look at the shift that has happened. It started with Reagan in the late 60s and 70s in California, and then it spread nationwide, especially when he, he became president, of passing on the cost of college from the state and the government to the individual student. So our big number is 47. So in 1980, net tuition, so let's talk about net tuition. So this is the amount that the family pays after free money. So you have your sticker price minus free money. So that's the amount that you actually pay. So net tuition, the amount, the amount that the parents and the student are actually paying. 1980, net tuition provided 21% of the revenue for public colleges and universities. And this is according to data from the state higher ed executive officers. Do you know by 2018, that percentage had ballooned to 47%? Oof. So basically, another way of looking at it was parents and students were paying about one-fifth of the cost, 21% in 1980, and now half the cost. Yeah. And that's the other half is either need-based financial aid, merit-based financial aid, or federal or state money. So that's a complete shift. And that explains why we now have a problem of $1.7 trillion of student debt. Yeah. So there's two big numbers all in one. $1.7 trillion of student debt and the cost of college being passed on from federal, state, and institution to the student and the parent. So big number of the day. So we're going to mix it up a little today, though. We're Normally, I will do a summary of the article and have Vince initially do some commentary. We're going to mix it up and have Vince introduce our article and uh, do the summary, and then we'll have a conversation. So take it away, Vince. And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. All right. So this today's article is from uh, Teresa Wantanibi from the LA Times. She's the educational writer, and she submitted a great article in the LA Times. And the title of the article, The Most Lucrative Majors, Some Community College Grads Can Out-Earn Elite University Peers. Great title, because it caught my eye. Yeah, mine too. So she starts out by talking about this young man, Elijah Calderon, who went, uh, who did a year-long program at Los Angeles Trade Technical College here in Los Angeles, right by USC, and is poised to earn after that year-long course one hundred and five thousand dollars annually as a power lineman. Wow. Once it becomes a journeyman in three to four years, he stands ready to make about one sixty-five and potentially much more with overtime. So he stands poised to jo- join the top 5% of wage earners among recent California college graduates. To uh, juxtapose that, a Stanford University student graduating with a bachelor's degree in political science, she goes to say, has a medium income right after uh, graduating after four years of $75,000 a UC Berkeley sociology major earns about $64,000 after four years, and a UCLA history major, $47,000 uh, a year. And then it goes on to talk about uh, the federal da- data that is accessible through this report called the HEA Group Research and Consulting Agency. 
And they really, that, that particular agency focuses a lot on educating and providing resources and information and research for families um, and those interested in this information that tries to help families think about when choosing majors and finances, finance is really important. What can you expect to earn? And, and what's really interesting, and this can this could be a game changer for many families, you could go to a much less expensive school and earn more in the same major than you than you would at a, at a school where you're going to have you know thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of debt. So they sort of outline that that particular application and through the, the many systems here in California, community college system, the Cal State system, the UC system, you can find majors offered comparable places and spend a lot less money. For instance, at San Jose State, graduates earn $120,000 after four years after graduation. And that's about the same rate that UCLA graduates earn and USC graduate earns actually a little bit less, 115, as well as seven, seven other UC campuses that offer the major in engineering. So San Jose State can cost you considerably less um, than, than those other campuses. And what's interesting is San Jose State, Chico, Long Beach, Fresno, Fullerton, Sacramento, CSU, San Francisco, San Luis Obispo graduates from engineering are annually uh, earning over ninety thousand dollars, and they've literally spent half or a third as much as students going to to more expensive places. So I think the point of this article is to help uh, families understand that the base tuition cost at a CSU is about six thousand dollars. UC, it's about $14,000. And at USC, it's $66,000. And if your potential to earn in a, with a particular degree is, is really high, you can really, <laughs> you can walk away with your education uh, with a lot of earning potential without having to take out loans or not have significant uh, loan amount. And I think it really can hopefully help families change the mindset and take out less of the uh, the burden of higher education and the cost. And, you know, when I was talking about this uh, article with a, 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 a parent in San Francisco, it was really a game changer for them. They had, they had assumed that, you know, the more prestigious the school, the more opportunities, the more I spend, the more opportunity I have, but just engaging in the particular major really helped shift our list, the list that we were creating, because they realized, oh, they have these talents. My, my son has these talents. We can do that at all these different places, and I don't need to be as stressed about the list because as we develop the list, is as long as they're studying the, the major, I'm really confident in who he is. I know that we can find some good values that might be off the beaten track. And it, it was a game changer. Well, Vince, that was so good that you've earned yourself a new job. <laughs> <laughs> You're now in Dave's status. So, oh. da so da da Dave has always been the one who has, when it's his turn to be up to the plate, he summarizes the article. You know, where for you and Julia and Susan, I would summarize it. You know, but that description was so great that look for me to ask you to do the summaries for your week, man, your month, my friend. That was really good. Thank you. You know, it, it, it no, I mean it. Um, there was it's a really important topic, and I really like the story you shared about the conversation you had with the family you were working with and how it reshaped the list. Because one of the reasons why I always rail against this fixation with prestige, this fixation with selectivity fixation with status is because I find in general, and, and I'm certainly not trying to say there's not any benefits at all to that, but in general, I think it's overrated 
when it comes to what are the things that really truly determine career success. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the big things that does that gets overlooked is what we're talking about here, which is that you're actually going into an area where there's a demand yeah. that pays well. Yeah. And another thing that's really overlooked is people doing a cost benefit analysis of what am I paying for college and what can I expect to return and factoring that in to how much, you know, especially this is especially true of people don't just have the cost of college set aside, which most people don't mm-hmm. No, if, if you're, you know, I did a session. It's been a few weeks now with someone and they have 500,000 in their four in their 529. I'm like, well, you know, that person can go wherever they want. I mean, they All have right. enough money set aside for probably undergrad and grad school, but that's not most people The half a million dollars in a 529. Most people are really struggling to see how am I going to afford this thing? Right. Right. And I think more, you know, I'm always happy when somebody brings this kind of data to me in the conversation and they say, based on what my student wants to major in, we're going to factor that into how much we're willing to either pay for college or if loans are involved, take loan debt out. Because that, you know, it's not, this is not a one size fits all. No. I mean, you showed it right there. One year program and the person's coming up making six figures. <laughs> and they, meanwhile, you juxtaposed it to some of the most prestigious schools in the country, the Stanford's and the USC's and the Berkeley's, and they get a degree in a certain major and they have X amount of them. And listen, this is not, we do not mean to imply that you need to only go into these high earning majors. Right. Because you got a passion for something, you love doing it. You're going to enjoy your day every day, getting up, you know, for six, eight, 10 hours a day. That's priceless. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want you to be naive. We don't want you to be naive what the compensation may be in certain professions. And because I do think, I do find that this is not something that people know, and they do work off of the assumption. If I just go to the Stanfords of this world, then they just assume that, I like this is a bit of an embellishment, but the Red Sea parts for me. (laughs) You know? I mean, some of them out that way, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, some you know, sometimes I'm talking with people and they're looking at certain majors that I know are in high demand. But they're nursing, the comp side, those kinds of things. And sometimes I'm having conversations with parents and they're kind of concerned about, well, I don't know, I've never really heard of that school. And I'm like, your student is going into a profession where, where I mean, there's a dearth of people in their area of ex- what will be their area of expertise. And there's a war for talent. They're looking everywhere. They don't only recruit. And what, you know, I, you know, Salingo in his book, Who Gets In and Why, he had stats of something like 5,800 kids get, get degrees from, you know, the elite elite schools every year. And he was like, Guess what? There's more than 5,800 jobs out there. Employers need people from everywhere. Right. And so people like, don't realize that if you're graduating in an area that is in demand, you don't have to go to an elite school because there's more. it's more about the skill set you have yes. than the name of the school when it comes to the job market. Yes. And that's something that really gets overlooked. And the other thing that is overlooked that I like that this article get brought out brought out is to think through what you can expect to make versus what you're going to pay. Now that's going to be different for different people because like, and that's why I shared the example of the half a million in the, in the five twenty nine because I'm not trying to say that nobody should ever go into a profession if it doesn't look like the pay is promising. First of all, when we had. Kirby McKillar on the podcast, she she gave the number. Only 26% of people are actually working in an area where they got their degree. So a lot of times people get a degree in something, it's foundational, and they do work in another area. So that's an important piece to add to this conversation. But what I find is all the data that you talked about, it's not something people even think about. They just assume brand name school, I'm sure it's going to lead to incredibly incredible prospects. And so 
this kind of information is surprising. And I know it's surprising because anytime I'm share it, share it, people are startled by it. Um, so I think it's incredibly helpful information. Yeah. Because one, it can allow people to experience some diamonds in the rough when it comes to schools. Also, it can lead people to not have, which is one of the most frustrating things, a disillusionment, where there's a gap between your expectations and your reality. When And that could be true for income or even how hard or easy it is to get work. So those are some of my thoughts, Vince. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think the other thing that I thought was really helpful, and I, and I did... Some I did look at it because it's so easy to understand is when you look at the federal college scorecard that came out uh, during the Obama administration, yeah. it really lays out clearly. You can look at a school and it says, this is what you can expect. You can look at it by major. What do colleges expect? And there are some really uh, very prestigious schools where their return on investment is not that high. <laughs> I'm really glad you brought this up, Vince. Like, this is the time to talk about the scorecard. We brought it up before, but not everybody hears every episode. I mean, the scorecard got a lot better when they went back in and they included income data by major. Yes. Because before, you know, you're always going to have high average salaries at the Harvey Muds and places that are tech. Illinois Tech, you know, Stevens Institute of Tech, RPI, WPI, not to mention you know, the Caltechs and MITs, the world, you're always going to have high average salaries for your tech places. But now you have the ability to literally go in and compare major to majors income by school and factor that into your assessments. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what I loved about that, even within the tech sector, to be able to say, you know, I have a, a student at Rose Holman who will be a sophomore when we started talking about it, he had never heard of that school. His mom had never heard of that school. It allowed me to talk about schools that had not entered the lexicon. They don't have big sports programs. You know, they don't, they don't win the NCAA uh, sure. basketball championship. So I loved looking at that scorecard. But the other interesting thing was, and I'll, you know, <laughs> it makes me want to contact Bentley and ask, but I was looking at the return on investment uh, scorecard that comes out from Georgetown, and Bentley scored higher than Babson. They went from 19 to 8. And I thought to myself, how did that happen? Like, what happened to those graduates? I thought to myself, in one year, it jumped from 19 to 8, and Babson is 9 now. So I thought, <laughs> wow, what's Babson saying? But having that information... Bentley, they're taking probably 40% of their applicants. And that's a place that people should be excited about if they want to study business or something related to business or marketing or PR. They apparently do it really well. Yeah, and Bright's another one too that flies under the uh, under the radar in in, in in Rhode Island. You know, um, so yeah, so so really good stuff. I think it, it's always challenging capturing the nuance in these conversations because and I've said this, but I want to say it again because I really think it's going to be lost. We're not saying just go where you're going to get the most money, right? No, There's nothing's worse than you know hating what you're you do at six to eight, ten hours, twelve hours a day. That's not that's going to not going to be fulfilling. Um, however, we're also saying don't be naive. We don't want you coming out with a degree thinking you're going to make eighty and you ended up making forty. I mean, one thing that I'll never forget was uh, in the news we did uh, maybe a year or two ago, Vince, where we looked at the amount the average graduate thought they were going to make versus what they actually make. And it's significantly lower. Like the perception is out there. The perception that's out there is not realistic, what, what students think. Uh -huh. And so that's another thing we don't want. And just approaching, you know, knowledge is power, right? So just approaching this whole conversation with knowledge in mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and we're certainly we're not into money. So if you, hey, I, I think anybody would rather make money than not make money if those are your choices, you know, and, and so we don't want you to be naive about that. Well, well I, and if you are going to do something that seems maybe not as lucrative as other majors, can you layer something in that will give you skills? that will make it possible for you to explore other things. You know, I have a student who 
loves language. She speaks six languages. She's fluent in five of them. She wanted to study linguistics to have this whole arm of computational linguistics. She could do computer science anywhere. They're going to look at the research she's doing, the classes she took. She could stand with the best of them. They, she can program. She knows what she's doing. But if you can layer something in that gives you other opportunities, that also is a way to, to make sure that you, you can maximize the money that you're spending. I mean, that's a really, really, really good point. And, you know, and sometimes I have students and parents, mostly parents that come to me with this same thing. They're like, my student is interested in a major that I know doesn't pay the highest, slow job growth rate. But let's talk about what the schools you're recommending offer when it comes to dual degrees or even minors to pair it up with something that is more marketable, even if it's just as an insurance policy. Right. If you don't get what you're hoping to get in. And I think that's really important. I think it's really strategic and really smart. And I've seen that really work well a number of times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A number, yeah. a, a number of times. I remember a student I worked with uh, that ended up in Davidson. And they were paying full pay. And I remember I met with the dad after uh, first year. And he's very, very much a businessman kind of guy. Owns his own business and very much business. And he came back and and I was like, how's it going? He's like, it's not going well. And I was like, what's wrong? He's like, my daughter's telling me she wants to be a philosophy major and a sociology minor. (laughs) You know, and he's like, I'm not paying. I'm not paying, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) So to make a long story short, she she ended up picking one of those two, but she paired it with economics. And she actually and then I met with him again after she graduated, and he's like, you know what? I am so happy to be wrong. <laughs> She's gainfully employed. There you go. She's I never, never forget. She's off the family cell phone plan, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> She leveraged that combination. So she basically got to go to college and study what she wanted in college and then paired it. In her case, it was economics. And then she did a couple of summer internships and it worked out really, really well for her. You know, she's doing something she enjoys. She's making good money. She got to study what she wanted in college. Yeah. And so he's like, I'm very happy to be wrong, you know? But man, he was not a happy camper when he thought it was philosophy and soch, and he was, you know, paying seventy thousand at the time. It's more now. But she did exactly what you said: paired it with with another major, and it served her well in the marketplace. Absolutely. Thanks, Vince. You're welcome. Thanks, Vince. Another great discussion. Take care. Yep. Same to you, my friend. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Friends, I believe in giving honor to whom honor is due. And Julie has been doing a bang up job with us here at your college bound kid. And one of our listeners uh, recognized that and sent in a message about Julia that I want you to listen to now. Hi, Mark. It's Barbara from Akala. Just checking in with you. Hope you're feeling much better. My reason for calling, though, is really a message for Julia. Coincidentally, a friend of mine has a son who's at Milton, and I asked him, so have you ever heard of Julia? And then he went on and on and on gushing about how amazing she is. I think sometimes we need to remind people how wonderful they are. And I wanted to let you know what this student said. Hope you're having a great day. Hope we can connect soon. Bye. All right, Julia, I'm going to play the question right away and then we can discuss it. Hi, my name is Suzanne and I am the founder of More Educational Services. I am working with a bright um, young lady who is very creative this year. And for her personal statement, she has decided to write a lengthy poem about herself. 
I have never seen this before. And I was just wondering if this is something that admissions officers would find acceptable or completely unacceptable and throw her application out. Thank you so much. And I appreciate everything that you do. Okay, friends. So do you and I have a confession? Yes, we're coming clean. (laughs) We're coming clean. Confession hour. (laughs) We recorded a whole segment on this. And then afterward, we said to ourselves, did we just give our opinions or should we survey and talk to several admission officers? Because this is a really good question. We have a lot of college counselors who are putting a lot of trust in what we have to say and listening to our feedback. Neither one of us had had enough experience with getting poetry in the form of personal statements to to feel really comfortable answering this other than it being our thoughts, our opinions. So we said, let's redo this recording. Let's take a survey of the post of admissions people out there. And Julia came back with all kinds of feedback from all kinds of people. So Julia, why don't you, can you read some of the things that you heard from different admissions people? And then I'll share my three She's such a high achiever. I got like three opinions and Julia got like more than 10, I think. (laughs) In your defense, you were driving 5,000 miles and you're good and you don't text and drive. How about that? (laughs) I wish I could say that. (laughs) (laughs) Always looking out for me. All right. So why don't you share the, the feedback you heard and I'll share the feedback I heard and then we can talk about it. Sure. So I'm also just really thankful for my network of uh, folks that I've worked with through College Horizons who represent a various amount of different uh, colleges and then in my um, in my line of work, in my current job as well. Um, so I, I want to say, Mark, we probably asked at least 10 different, most of them pretty selective institutions. We also asked some pretty funky, artsy mm-hmm. institutions as well. So here's a few uh, quotes from some of the folks um, that that chimed in. Even if the student is a great poet, there's no telling about the taste of the reader or their comfort level with more creative submissions. Therefore, there is an inherent risk. Um, I had three different um, admission officers use the exact phrase, it's not my favorite thing when I see a student submitted a poem. Um, I also had um, someone who is not super effusive all the time say, it's a terrible idea (laughs) to submit a poem. I um, I agree that there is risk involved. And fundamentally, it's not what the student was asked to write. It's not one of the prompts in the common app, I guess we could argue, you know, anything you'd like to put in there, but, uh, but that actually gave me pause. I had not in my 15 years of admission actually thought about that is not the purpose of the common app. Um, So, so thankful for that. And then a few other people also mentioned the idea, mentioned that they themselves don't feel confident interpreting the poem for the student. Um, And so even if it's well written and maybe obvious, it is a piece of art and up for interpretation. And so they might either the student might lose their purpose or the reader doesn't understand their purpose or didn't gain much from it or didn't understand the poem to begin with. So um, that was very different than I had originally thought where I thought there's a risk involved, but I was Mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah, like if you've got it in you, like please, let's try this. So, I will uh I will tread more lightly from here on out. Yeah, this this question both was ended up being professional development for both you and I mm-hmm. because I was also of the view that as long as you have the reflection piece that schools value so much and they learn new things about yourself, it's a risk And if you're really the creative type, maybe it's an opportunity to showcase some of your creativity. But um, I just didn't have enough experience with it to or or hadn't talked to enough of other admission officers to know how they felt. So you have some more quotes over there, Julia. Any more you want to read? I know you sent me a ton of them. Yeah. So I would say we I did ask two rather artsy schools, and these are places that actually have very strong 
um, creative writing um, backgrounds and and um, and majors as well. So one uh, admission officer who uh, works at a very uh, arts humanities forward institution with a very strong creative writing uh, major actually uh, said that the poem would not be their favorite and added that the message can get lost or it could take me a minute to figure out what they wanted to say. And I don't have enough time to figure that out. Sometimes it might make sense if throughout the application they talk about their poetry and writing and didn't have another place to put that as part of their background. But I'll be honest, it's never my favorite. <laughs> mm-hmm. Didn't you have one or two that liked it? I remember reading something you sent me. I had, I actually, I surveyed one Ivy League institution who two admission officers had very different uh, mm-hmm. takes and one almost one of them did say almost always it works out um, and that they actually really like that. Mm -hmm. It gives them a chance to look into uh, sort of their writing. However, they are, they did mention though, they're not the creative writing or poetry faculty. Mm -hmm. So they might've liked it, but it doesn't mean that that was uh, what tipped them in or, or that it's, it's not a good measure necessarily of their prowess, but it landed on that reader. Well, but, the fact that there's so much variation, even at the same uh, same institution, uh, just goes to show, I think, that there's a, a significant risk involved. Yeah, so I'll, I'll share some of my my research. Uh, the first person was like, "No, bad idea. Don't like it." Ooh. Uh, yeah. The next person said um, something that you you alluded to a second ago. Um. They said that I don't like it because it takes me too long to read and to interpret. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we're under such time constraints. So, and I actually had not thought about that. Um, And then let me read a quote from a third one I spoke to. I have seen some really done. uh, I have seen some really well done non-traditional personal statements spoken word mixed with prose dialogue bilingual sometimes i've thought that additional information would have been a better place for it but sometimes it works just fine for a very good writer i wouldn't want a poem to be the only sample of the student's writing in the file however Mm. so have you have you read all yours? Or are there any that you didn't share? Uh, the other quotes are really similar to the other ones. So mm-hmm. um, pretty mm-hmm. much overwhelmingly, besides one person who was who said what we had initially said, which is like, yeah, if, if sure. that's your strength and that's mm-hmm. what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, only one person out of the 10 plus people I surveyed said that. <laughs> yeah. And for me, there were two thumbs downs and one. I've seen it done really well, but I'd like to see other writing in the file. So that's pretty. The bottom line is when we summarize everything, I think we'd our consensus has to be it's too risky to advise anybody to do this, given, you know, the fact that I think you got spoke to more than 10, at least it was about 12. Julie was just firing the quotes at me left, right and center. <laughs> and, you know, and amongst ourselves, we know these people. So we're saying names, but. They didn't give us permission to share their names, so we, you know, we're not doing that here. But, um, but I would say it's fair to say it's a wide range of different schools from a standpoint of size. More of them tend to be on the selective side, but you know that's actually a good criteria to use. Like, what does a selective school think? Yeah, I think when you're thinking about it. So, after all the input, I think when you feel safe to say, Julia, that we would not advise somebody to do it. Not worth the risk. I guess that's where I'm landing. I think if the yeah. student was really passionate, I would just lay it all out there about what the risk is and then, you know, let them support them no matter what. But I, I think, yes, I have revised my initial answer. Well, you know what? I think the last quote I read lands with me. You know, I borrowed that language from you, lands with me. And I love it. I'm close <laughs> to think of you every time. I mean, there could be a place to submit it in additional information, especially if it was shorter. Right. Not the length of a personal statement. Yep. If it was like a hundred word poem or something, you know, to display that level of understanding, especially if it gave you unique insights into who you were as a person and it was shorter, 
um, I still would feel comfortable there. Mm -hmm. You know, would you? I think so. Yes. And I usually do encourage students mm -hmm. to do that. And if anything, now this may be relieve some pressure for those students who do feel that that is something they want to be part of their file, but now they can just submit it in a more pure, authentic form rather than feel like they have to show their stuff in the Common App essay. I can't think of any question in six years of doing this that that is like strengthened my professional development. Yeah. Oh, like wow. this one that caused both of us to go to the learning laboratory and to check into with a bunch of sources that have maybe read more, maybe read more applications than we have and, mm -hmm. and survey the landscape. So I, I feel, thank you. I feel like my skills have been better developed and I'm glad that we didn't go with our original recording because I think we did talk about the risks, but not, our sense was not that 80 to 90% of people are uncomfortable with it. Exactly. We didn't, we didn't have that. Like we no. didn't convey that. We conveyed it was risky, and it would depend on who read it, but not anywhere near this extent. So, so Suzanne, you earned your book that you're getting sent. I'll tell you, and thank yes, you so thank much you. for <laughs> helping us, making us better counselors for the next time we're asked this by one of our students. Yes, thank you, Suzanne. You'll get a copy of Elliot Felix's outstanding book, How to Get the Most Out of College, subtitled "127 Ways to Make Connections." Make it work for you and make a difference. Thank you, Suzanne. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, the last two weeks we've had part one and part two of our special interview. This will be part three, which will be the final part of our interview. Listen and enjoy. Uh, there's a story in the book I tell about um, uh, a woman named Brienne. She's uh, she's just finishing her first year at Northeastern Law School. She's she's an extraordinary human being, and um, it's a, she had a very very challenging childhood, and she just is incredibly optimistic. Just the sort of human being you love being around. She's kind. She's she's brilliant, and. Everything's going along. And then she's like, I'm $700 short. What do you mean? And she's like, I can't afford, I owe $700. I can't afford to get my diploma. And that could have ended law school. And I just think it's, it's incomprehensible, even if you're in, you know, <laughs> even if you're at the median income in America, right. to imagine that $1,000 could derail a life, but it can. And I see it all the time. So, and then... You know, I, I don't know that the that all the students understand that or believe that that's really the case, but sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the colleges conveniently define what they believe your financial need is um, based on sort of sometimes very opaque formulas. And so people don't realize how much they can get gapped. Um, and like you said, like $1,000 can be an absolute barrier to someone. So it's hard. I yeah. was at a... Uh, convention um it's SACAC which is like the association for like high school college counselors and independent college consultants and there are some like college admissions professionals and a couple of my colleagues did a presentation mostly towards the college admissions professionals saying you put all these inherent barriers in the common app in your supplemental essays you give confusing information um, you know, why are you doing this? You say you want diversity on uh, economic diversity. This is how this affected this kid that I worked with, you know, um, who is, you know, first generation, his parents don't speak English. Um, how is he supposed to answer this essay question? Um, how is he supposed to contemplate, you know, what ethical dilemma he solved that day? He's just trying to eat. And, you know, the response was really interesting because it was like, a wall. And then the rep from Michigan State said, well, you know, we don't ask that at Michigan State. You should just send them all to Michigan State. And I'm like, yeah, well, I've worked pro bono with kids in Michigan, and you gap them. They can't afford to go to Michigan State. I would love to send them there. It's a great school. You know, and so it's just this dilemma. You know, the whole system makes it so hard for these kids. For sure. I mean, I just think at the most fundamental level, you just need to create an incentive for these schools to significantly increase their 
representation of socioeconomically disadvantaged students. So if we just said, hey, your your tax break is contingent on, you know, doubling the number of Pell Grant recipients you have or tripling the number of students who are there from the it bottom, would happen they just would have to figure it out, right? But they have no incentive to do so. And the solutions would look different in different places, and that's fine, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, that's okay. Um, I was just going to ask if you think that would ever happen. Like, and that's the problem. Like, you know, how do you get some like a law like that passed? Well, you know, I, I think it's going to happen. I think the question is whether it comes from the left or whether it comes from the right. So, you know, you're telling me a second Trump administration doesn't take on elite colleges that you couldn't imagine him just imposing a 15 percent or 50 percent excise tax on, uh, you know, earnings on endowments. And the question is whether or not that is going to be strictly punitive, just based on, you know, raw anti-elite sentiment, populist <laughs> anti-elite sentiment, or whether it's going to be leveraged to do some good. And yeah. boy, I really think these colleges are missing the boat because it, it, it it's going to come because it's an indefensible position. It, it's just not, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, I can't, I, I teach all this stuff all the time, but I just imagined if I was living in America in 1820 and we were talking about slavery, I, I think I just would have been like, well, it's got to end, right? I mean, it can't be a sustainable position to say people aren't, some people aren't human, right? That's not going to work. And I, I just think you can't, you can't say we're this noble institution that's all about the dissemination and cultivation of knowledge. But if your white mommy and daddy went here, we're going to give you a five time multiplier, you know, edge and applying. I mean, it's just not it's just absurd. Yeah, well, I, I can't imagine a Trump 2.0 administration tying that punitive tax to any kind of inclusion. <laughs> but we can only Correct. hope. You no, know. they won't. I'm saying it's either going to come from the left or the right. And if it comes from somebody like J.D. Vance or Trump, it's going to be harsh and punitive. Whereas you could say, all right, let's phase this in. You get X number of years to do this. Here's your goal. If you fail to meet this goal, here's what we're going to do with that money. Let's like in the bill that I helped write, we're going to send right, that money right. to needy colleges and needy kids <laughs> as opposed to, you know, using putting it in the general fund or we're still to fund corporate tax reductions. Yes. Well, that's a whole other topic. So one thing that you talk about in your book is like when an industry needs a guide it's probably gotten impossibly complicated. And of course, you know, in college admissions, college consultants are those guides. Um, and I know a lot of our listeners are college consultants, but um, you had some kind of um, thoughts about the profession, some that were not positive, but I think we should talk about it because um, we all need to like look at all sorts of opposing viewpoints. So tell me more about that. Well, I mean, my... You know, my antipathy is for the institutions that make this possible. Um, so, you know, I, 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 like I said, I don't have any argument with individual parents and I'm, I'm not going to quarrel with somebody who's trying to make a living. So I do think that the system is kind of enabling people to make a living in a way that I wish wouldn't really be possible right. or necessary. I mean, I think you have some simple fixes here. Uh, first of all, at an individual level, I think what you said uh, is an incredibly important thing to do. I mean, just, you know, I'm not here to tell people how to live their lives, but I, I think, you know, striking a balance between taking some money, some paying clients and taking some, I, I think that's, a, I think actually I think that's an extraordinarily significant moral ethical gesture. I'm going to mention that to my daughter the next time she gives me a hard please, time. I'll have her. I'll have her talk to you. Please, please do. I mean, I spend my life talking ethics with young people, so I'd be very happy to do that. Um, you know, and systemically, I mean, there are some excesses that are really unbecoming, and I understand that the egregious examples that I discuss in the book are not representative of what most people are doing. So you know, essays and stuff. I think it would be better if people just kind of went to a room just like they take the achievement test and, and they write their essay. Right. You know, I mean, I understand that that, that story I tell in the book about that um, consultancy that kind of helps you cultivate distinguishing excellences like with like, you know, $100,000 science fair projects. Yeah, I'm no, sure that's... Um, that's an yeah, outlier. That's, yeah. Ugh. 
But, you know, look, my basic proposition is any resource should be reasonably available, should be equitably available to all. So, you know, it's like SAT tutoring. You know, do I think that SAT tutors are immoral? I don't. I understand why people do it, but I think it's bad if we're relying we, heavily yes, on yes. an instrument that is right. gameable through tutoring. And I think, you know, something like Khan Academy is incredibly important. You should try to disseminate that information to as many people as possible. Uh, yeah. No, and I think that, you know, we all agree, I think, in the field that the essays are the most inequitable part of the process um, because they're so coachable, right? I mean, a lot of kids don't know, like, how to ma have the right balance of, like, growth and sense of humor and, you know, a little bad thing, but not too bad, you know, that, that seems to be the most effective kind of essays. Kids don't know how to do that. And I do think, if, you know, I personally think it'd be better if they just went in a room and did what they did and you know, that's what the college has got. But I don't, I don't know. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Well, it could. I mean, I, I, again, I think if you created some incentives <laughs> for colleges mm -hmm. to actually create, <laughs> I mean, then the colleges would change it. I mean, the colleges have enormous leverage. And, you know, going back to our discussion about neighborhoods and stuff, you know, there's not a lot of forces that I could see that could actually create some incentives for people to move through the country differently. But, you know, after um, University of Texas uh, went to the top class rank model, you create some interesting incentives, which is, hey, maybe instead of moving to the math, most affluent, highest performing school district, I want to move a little bit lower down yeah. the rung and be top of the class there. But that's good. That's creating diversity. Right. So there's lots of ways here to create some diversity. By the way, these colleges have infinite wealth. They could themselves send counselors out to the world to could, level the playing could, field. And that would be fine. They could send Lisa and Marks and Linda's everywhere. <laughs> Many For times sure. over. Let them hire yeah. you and send you to, you know, uh, a, a less, you know, uh, to a needy school district. And you start. I would love that. Actually. I'm sure you would. would I'm sure great. many people would. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I just wonder why are we not incentivizing people to do the pro-social thing? Why are we not incentivizing people to do what we think like? And I'm, I'm saying like the right thing. And I know that's people will disagree about that. But I think most people would probably say, you know, it, it, we should try to make things more equitable in this way or that. Why are we not financially incentivizing people to do that? I don't know. So I hope it works. I hope your plan works. Um, <laughs> I'll be very supportive of it. So Given all this, like parents, what should we do? What advice do you have for us? Uh, well, we're this is beyond the scope of the book, <laughs> right? <laughs> we uh, asked this of everyone, so I'm sorry. I told you oh, you'd have a surprising question. Fine. No, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I have my own views on on, on this. Obviously, I, I've spent, you know, I've developed my own version of kind of a life course and what I think leads a happy and fulfilling life. I mean, these questions are people every obviously has to struggle with them themselves. I'm going to say a combination. I very, very have a lot of, uh, I, I mentioned it in the book, I, I don't like the Frank Bruni, where you go is not where you should be from an institutional standpoint. I don't want to let Harvard and Yale and Princeton off the hook because I do think it's incredibly important diversity of access to those institutions so we can diversify private equity and diversify um, you know, investment banking because I think that has great consequences for America. And in fact, we've yes. seen some implicit moral choices that these institutions have made that I can't help think might have been different if they had a different set of people in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I absolutely agree. I, I, there were a critical mass of, you know, poor black bankers during the <laughs> subprime mortgage crisis. Yeah, they, they might, might have, have called said, an audible. Yeah, whose yeah. lives are you ruining here, right? So I don't know that for sure, but I know the con I'm pretty confident the conversation would have been different. At the same time, you know, I I I, I do think it's it's true that you know it, it's not none of this has actual any relationship to you know your value as a human being or, or your happiness. I mean, I'm I'm overall very strongly in the. Uh, 
Jonathan Haidt, Greg Lukianoff, Coddling of the American Mind camp. It's a real seminal book for me. And I think the best thing that we can do for our kids is to teach them resiliency. I mean, because we're going to fail all kinds of times. And I have to say, you know, in my own life, like um, maybe more of an answer than you wanted, but, you know, I was very educationally successful, even though I was not privileged but I had always done very well in school. Then I went out into the real world. And, you know, you keep moving up the curve. It's like, you know, you make it to the NBA and you've already always been the best basketball player. And all, all of a sudden, what? You know, there's LeBron James and he's so much better than I am. And so when I encountered failure for the first time, it was very, very challenging for me. And um, I don't know, I, I, I think it's it's just kind of good to teach kids that know, you know, not to be extrinsically focused for um, affirmation. Yeah. No, I think that's really true. What advice do you have for students who are going through this process? Well, you want me to give kind of uh, how I would game the system? No, no, no. (laughs) I know how I would game the system. Um, How would you game the system? Now I'm intrigued. Well, well, I mean, if you're a parent of means... Oh, God. And this is now going to please don't let this be the takeaway from this conversation. I mean, parents of means should apply early action to a school that's not a reach. And they should say that they don't um, they don't have financial need. And I would say they effectively double their chance, kids chance of getting into one of those institutions. So if you shoot the moon, if you if you know, if you wait and you apply to 20 schools and you shoot the moon, well, then you're in the general application bucket. They don't know whether you're oh, really yeah. going to come. And then you're in one in 100 if you're even if you have a 1500 or a 35. I mean, to kids. I mean, you know, I mean, I spend my whole life talking to young people. Um, uh, I mean, I think. Really, it's about a search for what is helps us live a meaningful life and. um it's good not to be poor. I think we have a lot of data that it's it's a very unpleasant experience to be poor. And then, you know, beyond that, what's really going to correlate with your happiness is whether you find meaning in your work and whether you have meaningful personal connections. And, you know, everything else is just going to be a kind of small bit of the variance, as they would say in the statistics biz. So I would try to find something that you love, uh, are passionate about, makes you happy. And, you know, I, I'm blessed in the sense that uh, I I don't do anything really for money. I just do whatever I find interesting. And so, you know, I, I was like, oh, I want to go write a book about elite colleges and how they really drive society apart. And so I spent three years doing that. And before that, I worked on a show on Twitch. <laughs> I mean, you know, I... I, I <laughs> what had, was the show? <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a sci-fi show. I have, I have an Emmy and Peabody Award, believe it or not. Seriously? I, how could I have missed that in the intro? Uh, you're Wikipedia. like, a, what is it, a, a uh, triple threat? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, all I'm saying is like, I just try to do what I find intellectually interesting. I sort of know what I want to do next. And I love, you know, I go into the classroom every day and I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a religious person, but hand to God, I'm happy to be there, excited every time I step in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope that all of our students can find a fulfilling life like yours, and perhaps even it's varied in your interests. So, you know, as I mentioned, um, no guest on your college bound kid gets out of here without being on the hot seat, and I think you said that seat is not that hot, um, which is true. It's a very lukewarm seat. But um, one question I have for you is what book have you read recently that you think was the most impactful for you? Well, I'm a reader, so I, I'm reading books uh, constantly. <laughs> I just read, um, I mentioned um, The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, I don't know if you know the book, but uh, one of the co-authors, Greg Lukianoff, was a fan of Poison Ivy. So the last book I read was his yet unpublished book, which is called The Canceling of the American Mind. Oh, my goodness. And (laughs) I am very, very sympathetic to this argument. While I am, you know, very left-leaning in many, many regards, um, I am very, very concerned with um, the damage that I think progressive wokeism has done to our ability to tolerate disagreement. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's really, really important 
Um, and um, I, I don't entirely understand it. Um, I don't entirely understand the impulse, but I'm, I'm very worried about the future of the academy, definitely worried about the future of speech in America. And I see the threat as coming as much from the left as I do from the right. Um, so that was a book. I actually told him, I was like, ah, that was kind of what I had in mind for That's my like, next yeah. book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you stole my ideas. He didn't steal You've also he's... shamelessly plugged his book. So that's great too. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a one, he's, he runs an organization called FIRE, um, which really has replaced the ACLU as the leading defender of speech in America. And they're an incredibly important organization and I encourage people to donate to them and follow what they do. Um, because look, you know, it's easy to think, hey, you know, I don't like what this person says and I'm going to cancel them or whatever, but you could just as easily be in the minority as the majority. And right, so, right. And I also just think, you know, I also think in the classroom, it's good. It's really good for people to hear things that, that you know, are even offensive or racist because in the real world, those things exist and learning how to manage those situations is a very, very valuable life skill. I agree with that. All right. So what is your favorite secret, like you wouldn't want lots of people to know, like junk food fix that you sneak around and have? Uh, what um, junk food do I like? <laughs> uh, <I've laughs> you had, don't eat junk food, I've do you? You're a, too virtuous. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't eat a ton of crap. And I, I actually don't eat, I don't eat very much meat, but I will say... And I thought Chick Fil A was really good, and I was like, you know, those mm, homophobic that's, that's guys—they yeah. really know how to make a chicken sandwich. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Now, do you watch um, TV or movies at all? I mean, I don't know how you would possibly have time, but I watch a ton of TV and movies. And remember, I just told you that I am like sort true. of a TV writer, so I've watched. I'm a I'm a sci fi junkie. I'm a I've watched. Uh, you'll be appalled at how much I've watched. So go ahead. Hit me. <laughs> do, you, do you sleep? I mean, how do you yeah. manage to do all this? I don't, um, I don't think I do that much. I'm, I'm very structured. So, and I'm, you know, I'm a writer. I'm very disciplined. Like I, I write for like four hours a day, pretty much every day. Um, but, you know, I watch an hour of TV at night before I go to bed. My, my wife, my daughter likes a lot of the same things. My wife and daughter like a lot of the same things I do. So... Mm -hmm. So what are you guys watching lately? We are watching, uh, we're watching the new season of Ted Lasso. We oh, are good. watching the new season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Awesome. Um, I'm glad you approve. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa's blessing. Thank you. <laughs> My daughter and I are huge fans of Tim Robinson's I Think You Should Leave, which you probably don't know. It's a sketch comedy show. I don't know that. Show. I have to check that out. Yeah, uh, it's a sketch comedy show. The new season is just about to come out. Um, and my wife and I just watched one of the Star Trek spinoffs, uh, Strange New Worlds, um, which I actually thought was fantastic. Um, All right. But I, I could sadly go on for hours about TV. I have very <laughs> strong views. That is the next interview. No, it's, it's funny because Mark, um, our co-host, he does not ever watch TV or movies um, and so we, we just constantly mock him on this podcast about that. He did not know who Al Woods was or Legally oh, really? Blonde. We discovered the other. He's like, Lisa, did you know that? I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm oh, like, I thought I you were say, telling me L from uh, from Stranger Things. I, I, you mean from Legally yeah. Blonde? Uh, the last yeah. movie I saw was was Heavy with Brendan uh, was The Whale with Brendan Fraser. Um, it's interesting as someone who's in the classroom a lot of the times, a lot of time. A lot of college students don't watch TV. So the whole way, like, it's very middle-aged that that's kind of our orientation to right. content. Um, but, you know, that's life. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think this has been such a powerful and thought-provoking interview. And, um, you know, like I said, I hope a lot of your ideas take hold. I, you're right. I think so much of this is ethically indefensible, as you say. And, you know, I would like nothing more for it to stop. But I also feel like it's going to take time. So we have to be patient and try our best. Right. That arc of uh, that arc of history is uh, very, 
you know, <laughs> has a low gradient. It's low and slow. Um, well, I'm so glad to have been here. I thank you for reaching out to me. And I was at dinner on Saturday night and um, it was uh, somebody in our neighborhood. I, we'd never, I didn't really know them before. And they go, you're going to be on your college bound kid. And so she's a huge fan of your <laughs> podcast. <laughs> And she oh told me goodness. that you quoted me, so I was very yeah. flattered, and I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that you take anything that I say seriously, and I really appreciate the spirit of, uh, you know, the question about. I mean, I did say some challenging things, but um, I, I, you know, I think these dialogues are incredibly important, and obviously, certainly, you and I agree on way, way more than we disagree about. So I bet that's the case. Yeah, overall. and you know, really, that's why we. We have the podcast because we know that people cannot afford, you know, expertise and understanding like what is a convoluted, a ridiculously convoluted application system. And so that's why, you know, we do we come to you three hours a week. We don't get any money for it. It's all volunteer done um, because we want to try to promote equity as well. So I think we're kind of on the same page and aligned in that mission. Oh, I appreciate that. I heard Mark's initial discussion of uh, of Poison Ivy, and I very much appreciated it. And I thought he was, you know, I thought I, I was very happy with his summary of my position, and it seemed very sympathetic to it. So thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Lisa. And now it's time for our College Spotlight of the Week. So friends, if you go to our website, uh, shortly after this airs, we'll get this up on the website, you're going to see two spotlights for USF. You might say, why are there two spotlights at USF? Well, I did a spotlight when I was out there in 2019, but it was one of our very first ones and really was one of the very, might have been the second or third one we ever did. And it was really short. I mean, like five minutes short. So, uh. We wanted Linda to do, uh, and Lisa to do a much, much deeper dive. And so that's why we're doing a second one at USF. This will be a 40 minute one over two weeks. Hi, this is Linda, and I am here with my co host, Lisa. And we're going to talk about the University of San Francisco. I'm very excited to talk about the University of San Francisco. It's a great place. You've been here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did visit it in 2019. Um, and I really was impressed, but I'm, I can't wait to hear your take on the place. Now, did you just notice that I said you've been here, right? As though I am actually at the University of well, San Well, you Francisco. are in your mind. In your mind, you're there right now. <laughs> I, I am. I am. I'm telling you, I am not here in the Midwest with a No, you're in humidity. this beautiful hill in San Francisco overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge. Yes. And can I tell you, I, so uh, I was there in, in March of uh, 2023. And the day before I visited the campus, I was at Berkeley. And it was what you would expect of San Francisco weather in March. It was cold and gloomy and windy. It was actually kind of a bad storm. You know, couldn't use your umbrella because the wind was so bad. And the next day, went to the University of San Francisco, and it was like a postcard, not a cloud in the sky, beautiful views of the Golden Gate Bridge and all of that. It, it was all of my pictures are of the Golden Gate Bridge from various dorm rooms. Um, so anyway... <laughs> <laughs> not, not really helpful. Which is not what really is helpful. important after all. Like, <laughs> I know, it's terrible. Anyway, so let, let me tell you a little bit about University of San Francisco. So a um, little history. So founded in 1855 as the St. Ignatius Academy, and it was originally in downtown San Francisco, which becomes important because their downtown location was destroyed in 1906 in the fire um, following the, the earthquake. And it moved near Golden Gate Park, and it's been in its current location since 1927. Um, changed its name to University of San Francisco in 1930, and um, it became fully co-ed in 1964. And then in 78, it acquired Lone Mountain College, which was the former San Francisco College for Women. So it's had some different iterations. It is really smack dab in the middle of San Francisco geographically. It's about three and a half miles from downtown, three and a half miles from the beach. 
and it is on one of those famous, infamous uh, San Francisco hills. You got to be in shape um, to walk around this campus. I obviously wasn't. But the San Ignatius Church is on campus, and it is absolutely beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's, it's got the Twin Towers. You know, you can see it from many parts of the city. And it's um, the parish of the Catholic Archdiocese, and it's the university's chapel. It is lovely. Size of the school, it's about 6,000 students undergrad and about 3,000 uh, graduate students. 55 acres all told. Uh, everything is right on campus, so you don't have to take a bus, you know, to part of the campus that's a mile away or anything like that. Um, average class size is about 22 students. They really have very few classes, over 35 students. And if you find a class with 40 students, that's really unusual. Um, student to, to faculty ratio is about 13 to 1. Um, this is a Jesuit school. And I, I know my last uh, college spotlight was on Loyola in Chicago, also a Jesuit school. I am not on a tour of Jesuit school. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of working out that way, but I really like their philosophy. Um, they And I like the way they present this, that they see religion as a resource that's available and never required. Um, they're really focused on community engagement. You're never required to take a religious uh, class. Um, I like their philosophy. You do have to take service learning class, uh, which is taking what you learn in the classroom and putting it into practice. In some of these service learning classes before, you know, you really think, oh, you know, am I going to have to go work in a church or something like that? Um, one of the ones that they talked about was for the biology uh, class, they learn about bees and they go to bee farms and which sounds really cool. And they do get to suit up and, you know, all of the really attractive netting and things like that. Um, so their service learning classes are tailored to, to the majors. Something else about the school is it is it is very ethnically diverse. And I hesitate here because in some um, uh, literature I, I have from the school, they say they're the number one most ethnically yeah, diverse. Yeah, other ones they say they're the number two. And that's what they actually said in the presentation. So it's kind of, you know, right there. Number one, number two. Um, not sure how much that actually uh, matters when you get to it, but very, very diverse. Um, and also, they uh, there's no majority. So it's not like 50% white or 50% uh, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. They have a large first gen population. Anyway, let's talk about academics. All right. Before I get to academics, political leanings, the school's in San Francisco. So it's it's going to lean center left, but it's a very welcoming place. And here are the, the numbers I was looking for. Um, talking about ethnically diverse, these are the most recent numbers I have. 26% Asian, 8% Black, 22% Hispanic, 24% white, 10% biracial, and 10% international, um, with a large out-of-state population and a really big Hawaiian population. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, academics. Like most of the Jesuit schools, there is a core curriculum. Uh, their core consists of foundations of communication, math and sciences, humanities, uh, philosophy and uh, theology and religious studies, social sciences, visual and performing arts. One of the things I really like about this school is all classes are taught by professors. There are no teachers. So you're getting all of the attention of the professors. Um, they have a lot of different majors and minors and some of them are, are kind of unique um, that you may not necessarily see everywhere. Uh, they have a performing arts and social justice major, and cool. that is a concentration in dance, music, or theater. Um, Asian studies is pretty common, but they have a concentration in Philippine studies, which mm -hmm. is not necessarily common. 
They do have art history and museum studies, which there could have been a time in my life that I would have taken that major on. Um, I find that really interesting information. They do have environmental science and environmental studies. Their business majors, um, they have several. They've got business analytics, advertising, finance and entrepreneurship, uh, international business and media studies. And they're also a STEM school. They have uh, chemistry, engineering with concentrations in electrical and computer engineering and sustainable civil engineering. Um, but what they're probably most well known for is their direct admit nursing program. Right. Yeah. It is very popular. Um, like I said, direct admit, they only have 120 spaces in each class. So it's definitely the most competitive major at the school. And the reason for that size is that's how many clinical right. spots right. they have throughout the city. So they really are bound by that number. Um, engineering is the other direct admit program that they've got. Mm -hmm. So all the rest of them, you just apply and then you can pick as you go. Exactly. So you can uh, you apply to the school and you can declare a major later. You don't have to uh, when you're applying except for nursing and engineering. So if you apply undecided, it does not count against you. Um, but you definitely would not want to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go into nursing and then change. Don't don't apply to nursing on a whim. One, <laughs> it's just going to be really difficult to get in. Um, versus the others. Um, the GPAs for engineering and uh, nursing are higher. Um, you know, it's a 3.8 average GPA for engineering and a 3.9 for nursing. And uh, for nursing, they're looking for you to have uh, biology, chemistry, and physics uh, in your high school curriculum. And you'll also have a couple of additional uh, supplemental questions on the application. For engineering, they're looking for you to at least have pre-calc. So um, they're not they're not necessarily looking for you to have calculus, A, B, or anything like that, but pre-calc uh, would be uh, a help. Um, the acceptance rate at the school is 51% overall, but for engineering, it's 38%, and for nursing, it's 14%. Mm -hmm. They do have pre-professional programs. They've got pre-dental, pre-law, pre-medicine, and pre-veterinary. And they also have a teaching credential. They have an honors college. And eligible first-year students are invited to apply. So you may get an invitation, and that's based on GPA. Um, but you can apply at any time during your time at uh, USF. You do have to maintain a 3.5 GPA to uh, continue to be a part of the Honors College, which is based on four pillars, liberal arts, global perspectives, interdisciplinary interdisciplinary inquiry, and experiential education. And, you know, I always look for the benefits of the Honors College or Honors mm -hmm. Program because it differs uh, school to school. And at USF, you the Honors classes have usually 20 students or fewer, and you get priority registration, and I think that's a big win. Um, your core classes have fewer students, you get research opportunities, you're invited to a speaker series. So there's definitely some, some benefits um, to the program. I'm talking a lot, Lisa. Any questions so far? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was just wondering, you know, this school is a really unique location um, in the city and it's on this hill, but you're close to everything. What kind of opportunities do students have just by being in San Francisco? One of the great things they do is um, public transportation. Each student gets um, a free muni pass, and so they can explore the city on their own. Um, they can take advantage of all of the arts. And, you know, San Francisco has amazing opportunities for, for internships and those kinds of uh, programs. So students are doing job shadows. They are doing internships. They're taking advantage of everything that city has to offer. Housing is guaranteed for the first couple of years, and then students, um, for the most part, move off campus. 
And while it's guaranteed, you don't have to live on campus. So you do have the option of living off campus. And I was really concerned about this because that San Francisco housing market is notoriously expensive. Um, But they have an on-campus housing department that works with you on that. And um, not a really not a problem. Um, And most of those apartments are gifted down um, to students. But They take full advantage of that amazing location in San Francisco. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you're a kid who wants an urban school, this is definitely one to take a look at. Yeah. And the the thing I like about it, too, it's an urban school, but it's in it's in a neighborhood. It's in the Richmond neighborhood. So it's you're not confronted with the, you know, the commuter traffic, you know, and I know San Francisco has been in the news a lot lately for um, dealing with the unhoused pro- problem and some of that. You really did not see anything like that around a campus. I felt very safe walking around campus and the students I talked with just a non-issue. So you have that kind of cloistered uh, campus feeling. But still, like I said, you're only three miles or so from downtown, right, so you can definitely right. uh, get to where you want to go. Yeah, and you're definitely going to be in great shape after like a semester there walking up that hill to class several times a day. I mean, you're, every day's leg day if you're a student at USF. That's what I think. I, the first time I ever went to San Francisco, I was 16 and um, visiting uh, my aunt and she was like, yeah, take my car. We, we we were in Mill Valley. Take my car into San Francisco. And I had just learned to drive a, a stick shift. <laughs> and I'm like, a stick shift, 16 hills. I don't know what my aunt was thinking, but she was crazy um, because, yes, I can't imagine even now. Mm-hmm decades later, um, trying to drive a stick shift on those hills. Oh, God. No. No, no. Actually, my tour guide, who was from North Carolina, he had nice broad shoulders. And I was really grateful. I was worried he was going to have to drag me up a hill <laughs> at the end of the it's tour. It's nice to know that you had a backup, right? Yeah. Because they drop you at the bottom of the hill. And they're like, bye. Um, <laughs> you're going to get your ride back up that hill. So, <laughs> Well, I had no idea. You know, I had the Uber driver drop me off at the bottom of the hill. And I took, you know, those one million steps up to the top. I, I don't know. Live and learn. Live and learn. <laughs> Anyway, um, some of the the programs that they have, um, I want to talk about the J. Paul Getty Fellowship, um, which is awarded to incoming students and gives them additional funds for four years to support enrichment activities like study abroad, internships, or research. Um, And this is for really the high-flying students. Um, The Muscat Scholars Program supports first-gen students, and they have a summer bridge program for these scholars, which is a two-week program um, before school starts to kind of get them um, up to speed on academic preparation and mentorship. Um, They take two courses. One is a writing course and one is elective. And this is also where they get introduced to the city. So they're taking all kinds of trips um, in and around San Francisco. And that is no cost to the student. Really a great program uh, supporting first-gen students. They have a Center for Academic and Student Achievement, CASA, and everyone gets an academic uh, success coach. And this coach stays with you for four years, even if you change majors. So this is an academic success coach. This isn't necessarily somebody who's saying, oh, you want to be a biology major, you should take this and this. This is making sure that you stay on track. So if you need a specialist, um, If you need any kind of support, they're kind of like your tour guide uh, through the college uh, process. They have a back on track program in CASA. So if you do fall off track, they're there to help you get back. Um, So students who are experiencing academic probation or anything like that, but they also have an early alert. So intervention, so students who are kind of teetering, um, they're there to help them. Um, And they have the PACT program, 
which provides students with support, accountability partners, and they really reach out to those first-gen students, students of color who may need additional support. Yeah, that is great. And I I am so glad to see colleges really start to emphasize these kind of higher touch interventions, earlier interventions. And I think we're going to see, you know, like a big increase in student success rates as a result of this. So I just think it's great more and more places are doing this. But to have your own academic success coach uh, that keeps track of you for four years, that, that could come in very helpful, at least from a parent's perspective. You know, (laughs) well, it's kind of like guardrails, you know, it's, it's hard to fall through the cracks when somebody is looking out for you like that. And yes, as a parent, I like that. And being a first gen student is scary. You know this. And I'll take all the support I can get uh, for first gen students. And certainly not just for first gen students. Um, But yeah, I, I like seeing those kinds of programs. Friends, this concludes the first part of Linda and Lisa talking about USF, the University of San Francisco. We hope you'll join us next week for part two. So, friends, uh, on Monday's episode, um, I'm debating a couple topics I want to share with you, and I don't want to tell you what it is now because I haven't decided. But we're in pretty good shape with our questions, so we can go back to just on Thursdays for now. So I'll share something deeply on my heart, and then we'll continue with the outstanding interview that Linda's doing with Ben Neely from Revolution Prep, really helping us to understand the digital SAT. I I really think what Linda did in that interview is she took every frequently asked question that somebody would have about the digital SAT, and Ben's a pro, and he absolutely hits the ball out of the park. If you want to know what's going on with this new adaptive digital SAT, cannot recommend this interview that Linda is doing with Ben Neely more highly. And part one was last Monday. Part two will be this Monday. And then the final part will be the following Monday. And friends, you know, on we do interviews, I like to ask our thought leaders for their best advice for students, parents, college counselors. Well, every once in a while, there's one or two that just really stand out to me. And and I like to go back and play those every now and then, because I think that they have enduring value. And so I'm going to play my two favorite ones so far which is Chris Gruber of Davidson, and also Heath Einstein from TCU. So the next two weeks, I'll close with those endings. So listen to some pearls of wisdom and words of wisdom from Chris Gruber. All right, last question. Your your best, well, it's really two, but your best advice for students I'm going to give you three because you're... You you keep changing the number. What's the deal here? Come on, you're a professional interviewer. What are you doing? (laughs) Being unprofessional. (laughs) Best advice to students, parents, and college counselors. Yeah. Um, I think for students, one is going to be appreciate that you have more control of this process than you ever think. Um, You do. There's so much of it that you can shape. Um, do things early, do things in a timely fashion, and you're going to do very, very well. And know that there's not just one place. I think there are a variety of places that you can go to. Treat it as though it's almost an additional course. Spend some good, good time on it. Um, Because I think where you spend your next four years can be a powerful, powerful thing for you. Um, So there's one. To the parents, uh, I think students feel a lot of pressure in this process. So the greatest thing to do is tell your students right now before they're starting the college search process that you're proud of them. And it will have nothing to do with the label that you put on the back of the car, the sticker, the sweatshirt, or the hat that you ultimately end up wearing down the road. You're proud now, and it doesn't have to do with where they're getting into college. Um, And and, and with counselors, um, it's always going to be know that we're in this together. we are we are partners we are colleagues and we are here to serve and i know that there's a lot of places that you need to be managing and understanding but let us know how we can help you we're ready to do it at any any step of the game see you on monday friends and that's our show a big thank you to you our listeners for tuning in this week if you find this podcast helpful please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. 
you can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.